Good afternoon. I'm Susie Robinson, also Susan Robinson, but I go by Susie a lot. Um, I uh, was happy to do this uh, presentation. I love talking about stress management. I actually did my doctoral dissertation on stress. Um, and have had extra training, so I love talking about it because it is a hot topic nowadays. So um, let's just get started right away. I've got a lot to show you. Um, there we go. Um, you know it's a big deal when World Health Organization defines it as the next health epidemic. And um, in a few slides, I'm going to show you why. Um, how it is affecting our health um, mentally, physically. Um, I'm going to show you some goals. But the first thing I want you to do is if you've got a piece of paper out in front of you, um, I'd like you to take just a couple minutes and write down five to ten stressful events or things that were stressors to you that's happened in the last two weeks. And then I will come back to that later in the presentation. But if you can um, do that for me right now, I would uh, like you to do that, and then we'll go on. As you're still doing that and thinking about things, I was going to tell you about my learning objectives today. Um, I want to define stress, um, become aware of the effects. I want you to become aware of the effects of stress on your physical and emotional health. Um, we're going to identify what causes stress, the stressors. And then I'm going to show you a very easy prevention tool um, that helps you prevent and manage stress. And then um, we're going to go through some experiential things. Um, I'm sure you can follow along as you hear me um, on how to manage stress. OK. So defining stress. Eastern philosophy calls it an absence of inner peace. And we all experience that at times where we just feel unsettled, just kind of seem to be in a funk. But Western philosophy is more about control, a loss of control. And as you can see that airplane spiraling down, um, you can see that any one of those things, if one thing happens, it could have caused the rest of it to just spiral out of control from a health, an illness, something happening on your job, uh, something happening to a family member, and then a change in our finances. But stress is a perception. It starts in the brain, central nervous system, uh, and it is your brain's reaction to what you can consider a perceived threat, what you perceive to be a threat to you. It can be external, like an accident, um, a policeman coming up about ready to give you a ticket. It could be a lot of things where you feel an actual threat. Um, it's, uh, but it is an internal product of our own thoughts and beliefs. And I'll explain more on that in a little bit. Because really, in most situations, there is no real threat. But it is how we perceive it. And it can change from one day to the next. One day, something totally wouldn't bother you. But depending on what life event happened in you, it could totally change, and the next day you would actually have um, something would cause you stress that wouldn't normally cause you stress. So what happens? The stress response, it's an automatic thing. You don't have to think about it. It is an automatic thing that your brain gets sets in motion, and your whole body goes through um, a whole thing. Everybody's different. There are some people that have receptors that are more sensitive to the stress uh, hormone cortisol. And so, but everybody's unique and everybody's different. 
And <clears throat> anyway, Walter Cannon was the granddaddy of all stress researchers. And he's the one that coined the term fight or flight. And so automatically, as you look at the pictures of the guy, one is angry and then one is running. So that's our anger and fear are the two emotions tied to stress. So this is just a snapshot of what all goes on. Like I said, your body goes through a lot of things when that perceived stress happens, whether it, it's something that's quick and it goes away or if it starts to be prolonged. But a lot of things happen. Your body goes through this amazing amount of things to help you. And um, like increased cholesterol, increased blood pressure, um, increased production of fats and sugars because that's the most readily source available of energy, you know, for that fight or flight. Um, protein synthesis happens, your digestion changes, your immune response changes, um, your metabolism gets faster, just a lot of things happen. This is really only a snapshot. There's so much more that actually happens. But this is the problem that I was why World Health Organization is calling this um, a next epidemic. If you can see everything that stress is connected to as far as illness, chronic, there's chronic diseases, fatigue, insomnia, um, autoimmune diseases, um, much of the things. Actually, up to 90% of the time that we go to our doctor, it is due to the stress's effect on us. It suppresses the immune system, number one. Uh, your immune system is like your army, your personal army. And so cortisol, when there's too much cortisol happening, it suppresses the production of the, the antibodies that latch on to the bacteria, the cancer cell, any kind of bacteria or something that's not supposed to be there. It latches on it, it marks it, and then it communicates to your, what I call your army and your Marines to come in and fight it. And so what happens, cortisol suppresses um, that production of antibodies. And so also too much cortisol causes inflammation. And inflammation now is, is kind of the hot topic as far as being related to many of the chronic diseases. Um, and it's a systemic inflammation. It's not the kind of inflammation that's to help you heal from a cut or anything. It's systemic. Uh, ladies, it actually affects the bone density. I've read the research on that. Um, the main thing that um, I've given you an actual, what I'm going to give you um, is some resources with a, a video that shows you what I'm about ready to talk about, the fact that it ages you. So everybody has DNA and it replicates all the time. Well, the caps on your chromosomes are called telomeres. And so the natural aging process, the telomeres snip at the end. But what happens with stress is it actually snips it off too fast. It's like the plastic on a shoestring, when it comes off, the shoestring ravels. And so you get too much snipping going on. And so the video is about a lady that was on a research team that won the Nobel Prize that actually looked at this. And so I highly recommend that you do go in and, and watch the video and learn more about that. It also affects our brain. So basically, when you're talking about shrinking the part of the brain where you learn and your memory, that's what happens when it shrinks the, the prefrontal cortex. And then it also stops the generation of new brain cells. And so and that all happens in the hippocampus. And then um, it actually increases the size and activity of the brain called the amygdala, which controls our emotions. And so that's why when we get stressed and we're emotional, sometimes we cannot think or focus. And so um, then it disrupts the synapse, those connections. And so what happens then is we can get to where we become less social. Um, you know, we lose that sociability, ability to make decisions and remember. So uh, kind of leading into the next time I present, it will be on brain health, and I'll go m much more in depth about this. So what do we do to manage stress? Well, most this is what most of the people do. Um, they turn to behaviors that are trying to give you some kind of relief 
from the stressful feeling. And so you see the people using tobacco and drinking food, shopping. Uh, the picture down there in the left corner is actually a cell phone. And <clears throat> I'm sure if you've watched any news reports, there's a lot out there now about being addicted to our cell phones. So when we form these bad habits, um, it gives us an immediate satisfaction because it actually um, involves dopamine. And so um, we get that immediate satisfaction, but we don't feel good about it later. And so um, that's why it should not be used as a, a thing to help us cope with stress. So, but is all stress bad? No, it's not actually. Our brain and our bodies like homeostasis. That means it likes to just stay level all the time. So, but we actually do need some stress. Um, the U stress means good stress, and that's where you are able to, to get up and get geared up for your job. That's how what Russell Westbrook gets ready, ready for games. Um, and it's moderate right there in, in the middle is where you need to be. Um, and so what happens, though, when we're under-stimulated, and that leads to people probably being bored, depressed, and stuff, you actually are at risk for illness as much as somebody who's working 80, 90 hours a week. So again, we do need some stress. So think about a guitar. Um, to play a guitar, you have to apply pressure on those strings, and you even hit the strings from those strings, but it makes gorgeous music. And so I know every day, if you're teaching and, and working in schools, that you have to get up, uh, get some stress behind you in order to do your job and face those kids and teach those kids. So now I'm going to get into the causes of stress. Uh, the first one is environmental, bioecological, so to speak. Uh, there's many things out there that we don't think about, like power lines, power grids. Um, Believe it or not, I'm sure you've noticed the difference when we now have more sunlight lasting better, uh, longer through the day, and um, also, um, you know, it's getting a little lighter in the morning and stuff. But seasonal affective disorder is actually a real thing. And so um, that's because, again, the serotonin is less whenever there's less sunlight, and serotonin is the feel-good hormone in our brain but also noise, but something we don't think about is um, processed foods causing stress on the body, and it actually does. And so um, those mean, that's why we mean by bioecological and environmental stressors. The next is life hassles. Life hassles <laughs> can be from having a partner that, uh, husband, partner that you're sleeping with that snores, it could be noisy neighbors, it could be locking your keys in your car, and traffic, you know, Oklahoma City is growing tremendously and we have a lot of traffic nowadays. So, but the thing is about, that doesn't seem very much, you know, being hassled, but accumulation of these can actually have an effect on you as if you had a loved one die. And so um, that's why we, you know, later on we're going to get into problem solving and seeing how we can kind of prevent some of these things. The next one is social. And our social stressors mainly involve change. Nobody likes change but babies <laughs> with wet diapers. So um, what about the social? Social influences on our stress, it could be good, any kind of change, like getting promoted. Um, and if you see the little cartoon, it shows like trying to get your kid to go to school and then later as they're older, you don't want them to go. But changing your finances, moving, even, it's, even if it's a beautiful home, um, it's change. Anything that causes change. If, you know, I tell state employees, it's like, if you work for the state, our middle name has changed. So uh, Richard Lazarus actually was the researcher that came along uh, later, and he believes that it's a central concept behind all stress. And um, anyway, I wanted to find out why. When I was doing my dissertation, I wanted to find out why. And so one of the professors put me on to, oh, sorry, I spoke too early. Why is change hard? It's because we cannot see what's behind the door a lot of times. Um, 
it's stepping into the unknown. We're moving out of our comfort zone, our routines. Um, we're just not able to cope sometimes with stress. I mean, with change. It's hard. And I know that because I just moved <laughs> my mom into a, an independent, beautiful independent living facility. I thought she would be happy, but the change has been hard. And so uh, even though it's a good change, it's been hard for her. So I wanted to find out why, and that's when the professor put me on to Dr. Kurt Lewin. And what happens when we're going along, like I said, in our routines, and then all of a sudden we hear change. Uh, like I said, be it that you're moving, be it that you're getting a promotion, um, and the brain starts to unfreeze, and then the chaos happens. You know what I'm saying? Because we're trying to get used to it, and during that change, it's, it's very um, disconcerting sometimes. And then once we get into that change, the new routine, that could be having a new baby at home, it could be having a new spouse, you know what I'm saying? And once you get into your routine, the brain goes back into that frozen uh, state. And so that's why I always want to tell people why does change cause stress? And uh, it totally made sense to me once I saw that. So, guess what? <laughs> Technology is probably one of the biggest changes that's happened in our social life for certain. And so we can see how it's changed from the old phones where you talked to somebody, an operator, to the new iPads, computers, and the smartphones. Now the watch that you carry around, everything can be done. You, I see people talking to their arms, and uh, it's just amazing how it's all changed. But in 2017, American Psychological Association did research, and what they found was that technology has definitely improved our life. When you think of the medical advances that's happened and the medical research going on, it's amazing. And how we can talk to somebody across the world just like that in an instant. But at the same time, studies describe the consequences of technology use, um, and that means impacts on our health, and uh, physical health and our mental health. What's happened is social media and us using these devices has caused a lot of things to happen where you've got young children sneaking these devices to bed. But um, even where kids, um, I've seen uh, babies like eight, nine months old, up to two years old, reaching for their parents' devices just like they were going crazy, like they were addicted, like a crack addict almost. And, uh, but then you see kids being isolated Nothing fries my bacon more, actually, than to see children here wanting to talk to their parents and socialize with them, and they're on their devices. So, and I see it all the time. These kids here on the left um, probably are texting each other. <laughs> and so, uh, it's amazing how they're not talking to each other, but they're just texting. And instead of facing each other, they're on the right and see face-to-face -face conversation where you can actually see somebody's emotions and maybe what you're saying could be affecting them. Um, you see people at restaurants all the time. It, it never fails when I go someplace and somebody has to wait a little bit, out comes that phone. Or at restaurants, they're sitting there on their phones rather than talking to each other like the people on the right-hand side. And I remember a restaurant that opened here in Oklahoma City where <clears throat> they, um, it was loud and bustly and noisy. And he said, well, people don't talk to each other anymore. And so, but then you've got Chick-fil-A who's offering you a free dessert if everybody puts their cell phones away, you know, and talk to each other. So um, it's almost like we have to be rewarded to, to do that. And so I think our interpersonal skills are really suffering right now. Um, so then we've got the study that came out about the devices that Americans collectively check their phones 8 billion times a, uh, a day. 46, no, I'm sorry, 8 billion times, 46 times a day, eight times an hour. And um, actually, with the younger generation, 18 to 24, they're checking at 74 times a day. And what's happened is you had the emergence of this constant checker. Um, so it's like um, 
you know, we're always checking for something and wanting something. And another video that I would normally show, um, that again, I left you the link in your resource packet, um, actually talks more about this and how that, what we're looking for. And it actually stimulates the, the part of the brain that, that's good, you know, the, the dopamine. So um, it's amazing what's happened. It's almost become a war game of the mind. Uh, we're not able to relax because of the anticipation of being called on. Um, you know, it's, it's like this 24-7, and our bodies were just not made for this. Our bodies, our minds were not made to be plugged in 24-7. So when I say digital dementia, um, we're forgetting things. Um, I actually read a story of um, a young Korean couple that their baby died because they got into gaming and forgot to feed the baby. And so I've heard other stories of, of kids being left at the mall. The mom just totally forgot about them. And so yeah, it's not a good thing. How is it affecting our health? Well, the main thing is people are on their devices way up right before bedtime, and their production of melatonin has stopped because of the blue light actually stimulates the pineal gland in the, that's in the brain that actually produces melatonin. And so when that light hits it, it automatically stops that because it thinks it needs to produce serotonin, which is what we have during the day. But also we get into it, it keeps our minds engaged, it makes us hard to relax. Um, if people bring it in their phone in the bedroom, it's disturbing your sleep because there's some people that are night owls that will text you or do emails or whatever late at night. Um, and again, that constant connectivity interferes with our long-term memory as well. Um, and that happens when we sleep, when the short-term memory goes over to long-term memory. Um, then digital obesity is happening and that's because people are not getting up and moving much. We're doing devices, we're not moving out of our cubicles even at lunch. Um, out of, um, we're going someplace and sitting and being on there. And that's why they call it the new smoking as far as its effect on our health. And did you notice, I did notice this, that schools are starting later and they're saying because kids are not able to get up and that's why it's because their sleep's being interfered with because they're on their devices so late. And that's, um, I also read where that 72% of the children have the devices in their bedroom. So again, I'm not poo hawing communication. I'm not, I mean not communication but technology, I'm not. It is there, it is necessary, it's helping our jobs um, do better, more productive, but there needs to be balance, okay? Um, a cell, everybody's made up of millions of cells, and so a cell membrane lets things in, it lets things out, and so it's like, be like a cell membrane. You know, you decide when you're gonna do it, when you're gonna let it out, and when you're not. If you've seen the movie uh, Thor, I loved Heimdall, um, he was there to, uh, let people in or out of Asgar. And so I'd say be like Heimdall. You know, protect your time, protect your health, and decide when and when you're going to allow technology in your life. So the highest percentage of stressors actually come from um, interpersonal, and that's because it involves our self esteem. Um, self concept is if you were to look in the mirror, you, that's the self-concept, what you see, but the self-esteem is when you, how do you value what you see in the mirror? And that has been affected ever since we were kids. This, your self-esteem was built from the time you were a child. Events that happened, people that made fun of you, being yelled at by a family member, uh, being rejected on dates like the girl you know, almost making fun because the guy wants to be nice to her and she's looking like, oh, what a geek, you know. Also, not when you get a not approval or received an F on a grade, um, that's how a lot of children uh, begin that self-esteem journey right there and it carries on. Well, what can happen is um, 
because of those events that happened long ago, we can be walking along, as you see the guy walking along, and we have an event or an encounter that happens, a disagreement with somebody, a rejection, or you didn't get the promotion. Well, your brain, before you react, actually goes right back to that boxcar. Dr. R. Morali Krishna, I follow him a lot. He's my mentor. Anyway, he says there's like a boxcar of past events and memories, and he said your brain automatically goes back there before you react. And so what can happen is we can begin to get in um, negative thinking patterns. And so um, here are some words that Dr. Krishna talked about. All or none, which is if something's less than perfect, it's a total failure. Um, that's perfectionism, and perfectionism can actually be very crippling. Then magnification is uh, blowing things out of proportion. And that so easily can happen, especially in this generation of social media and, and emails and texts, because if somebody doesn't email us or text us right back, you know, did we have a thought there that's probably blowing it out of proportion? It didn't even mean that. I mean, somebody can be, you know, coming into your building and you smile and hi and they, they don't even respond to you. And you think, well, what, what's wrong with them, you know? And um, you don't know what happened to them. They may have gotten bad news about a family member or their own health before they ever came to school or your building. And so we t that's just our natural tendency that we've got to be careful about. Overgeneralizing in our speech is not good. Uh, using words like always, you're always this, or you never do this. Uh, Overgeneralization is, is just kind of a bad habit to get in using those words. Um, then the mental filter where we see only the negative in situations or in people. Um, I liken this into, um, let's say a football team is ahead 21 to 6, but they go in and the coach does not tell them what they did right. I mean, they're ahead 21 you know, to 6, and all of a sudden, um, He's going on about the missed tackle here, the missed field goal, and stuff like that, and only picking out what was the negative. And so um, we can also do that with people. You know, sometimes bottom line is negative thinking and the way we look at things is a choice. And so um, one where we beat ourselves up is I should have or I wished I had done or I ought to have done that. Um, you know, we go on and on over things that we can't go back and change. So um, instead of learning from it and then changing it or maybe even go back and apologizing or something like that. Labeling is so easy and um, I have to be careful myself when I'm driving in the mornings. <laughs> um, saying words like just labeling people, you're a jerk, I'm a jerk, I'm stupid, you're stupid. Um, just letting words, calling people names, in other words. Um, then personalization is where you take the blame for everything. Um, that is a tendency to be, um, to have codependent tendencies where that you take the blame for everything, like it's your fault. Sometimes you want to be the savior, so you take the blame. And, and that's not always the good thing, taking blame for somebody um, that it was not your fault at all. And then the total opposite of that is blaming, and that's everybody else's fault. It's uh, not your child's fault, it's not my fault, it's everybody else's fault, avoiding basically the responsibility. And then paralysis thinking, and that's where people feel powerless, they feel like they can't get out of their situations. Um, sometimes they've never felt like they've experienced success. Um, and people that are in that situation typically you'll find are those that are in abusive situations. So, again, having a low self-esteem um, actually is also about loving ourselves, and which is not a good thing. Not only do we have our past that's, that's coming against us, um, but loving ourselves happens to be hard right now. And it's self where we accept ourselves, um, our hair color, our height, our, our body size, our style, um, and our capabilities, what we're capable of doing. Um, 
physical appearance, everything that prevents perfection. And this is why we have it thrown at us all the time by media, by TV. Um, Photoshopping is not a good thing, and that's what is being presented to us when it's not really real. Um, I have a video of this girl who's a model there on the left, and it showed where they actually lengthened her body, they lifted her eyes, they tweaked her nose, they lifted her mouth, put that sheen all over her, um, and it was not real. And so, um, but that's what's shown to us as being real. And it's not just with our bodies, it's our homes. Uh, HGTV shows these perfect homes after they build them and everything when reality is there at the bottom <laughs> where we where it's, life is real and it can even be in our yards I mean even uh, this old house everybody fixes up the I mean everything is shown to us is this is so easy when it's like who really has the time to do that well of course that's a TV show that was paid for them to do that so it's not really real, but that's what's shown can be there. And when we don't have that time, that perfectionism, it just keeps repeating to us how much that we don't are not satisfied with ourselves. So I say work on your self-esteem. Don't compare yourself to others because there is always someone better or worse than you in every aspect of our lives. Um, you need to accept that you are gifted. You are Everybody is unique and everybody is gifted and everybody is creative. And so we have to begin to look for those things. Um, also, Leo Buscaglia uh, says that to love oneself is the be beginning of a lifelong romance. So it is something we have to do every day because we live life in everyday life, there are people that are unhappy and they're going to try to make you unhappy. So um, just accept that you are gifted and you you have gifts and um, that you are worth it. Also, thinking about changing how we view things. Um, find the good in your situation. It's kind of like reframing when you're taking a picture and you change the frame of what you're going to look at and you look at it differently. Uh, Viktor Frankl um, is a theorist that he was in the Auschwitz, the Nazi prison camps, and he actually had his, he saw his family being put to death and they did unimaginable torture to him, but he made a choice and he said, Man can take away everything from you but one thing, and that's how you view yourself and your certain in your current situation. And so it is a choice. And um, you can do things like change your channel. It's it's like if you remember, if somebody's older, they might remember how you had to get up and walk over and change the channel. Um, but it's just clicking. Amy Batzel was an Olympic rower, and she got chosen to be on the... Uh, first women's sailing team and so there's believe it or not there's a lot of elite athletes that go through negative thinking and she was out there grinching and griping about everything and then she just said I changed my channel and I started thinking I'm on the historic team I'm on this beautiful boat I'm on the ocean and then she started picking out the positive is actually in her teammates and she realized how that had hampered her most of her athletic career and then um, another one, an NHL team that was on the tarmac ready to go and something happened to the plane. They had to get off and get on a bus ride and ride a bus to the game. And so instead of it being a short flight, it ended up being a long time. And so the coach was worried about the team and thought that they would not be in good moods, but two of the teammates come up to him and said, God, we're, Coach, we're just happy to be alive and playing because, you know, they could have went down. And um, I think I've read many stories after 9-11 happened of people that were delayed that morning and was not in the buildings when they went down. So, again, it's a habit. We can begin to think negatively all the time, or we can try to change these. I follow also Dr. Daniel Amen, and I got this 
statement from him, he calls the ANT attacks as automatic negative thinking. And he said, try to form a habit of when you hit the floor first thing in the morning, say, today's going to be a great day. And then if you do have a negative thought, actually stop, write it down and go, is this really true? And then before you go to bed, count your blessings, list at least three things that you've been blessed by. Um, you know, he says at the dinner table, share what went well that day with everybody. And then um, also finding somebody that you appreciate and reach out and tell somebody how much you appreciate what they have done for you, either being in a quick text or a note. So the good news, life doesn't have to be stressful. Just as having high level of stress, you know, can lead to negative health consequences and stuff, managing it can actually improve your health benefits. So we're going to follow the Porter stress model. And the Porter stress model actually is, um, he's used this with the Department of Navy and some several high um, big corporations and um, Anyway, I, I liked it. It's easy to do, and it just made sense. It has six steps. Um, raising awareness is the first one, then problem solving, and then cognitive restructuring or re changing your thinking, mindfulness um, or acceptance, and then resilience, and then social support are the steps. So the first one. In the packet I'm sending you, I'm actually, um, it has a perceived stress scale that I hope you guys take part in. Uh, I am going to show you uh, the packet after I'm done here in a little bit. Um, anyway, raising awareness. If we go through life because we're being hit 24-7, torn in many different directions, and we're just not aware. And so we're not even aware that we're stressed. And so the first step is to do an assessment. There's many out there, life event surveys, perceived stress scale, work stress surveys. There's many out there online uh, or in literature. And the second step is to write it down. Get you several little pieces of paper, post-it notes, or little tiny notebooks. I carry around this little tiny notebook. And just write it down. Um, make yourself aware. And he recommends doing that for about a week. And you can start to see patterns, number one, of, uh, you know, what may be happening here. But he, he says write it down. Actually keep it for about a week and just make yourself pay attention. Then this way you can go to step two, which is problem solving. Um, problem solving is where you're going to look at obvious causes of stress, look for underlying causes of stress, and you're going to try to eliminate the stressors that are in your control. And um, problem solving can be a lot of things. So I have a book here, which I've listed again in the resources, called A Whack on the Side of the Head. And I just want to tell you uh, a story with one. I'm going to read it real quick. Um, several years ago, the pool where the author's master swimming team worked out closed for a month for maintenance. And during the downtime, the members had to practice with the other clubs at different, and each of them had to go different places. And when they were reunited a month later, there was a great outpouring of new workout ideas. Um, one person had been with a team that had low rest interval workouts, another come back with heartbeat interval workout, and another found a new type of ankle pull, t pull boy. Um, all of them were discovered, and it forced them to break their routine. And so they brought it all back together, and it ended up being good. Another one is Thomas Edison, who had invented um, the telegraph. Anyway, a, a very rich person came in, bought it all up, and it took away his creativity where he was focused. And so he got whacked in the head, um, and it made him look for other ways to try to problem solve and to do things. And so within a few years, you know, he came up with the light bulb, the power plant, the phonograph, the film projector, many, many other inventions. So problem solving, looking for ways. Look for underlying causes. Was there time pressure? Um, is that how come you get in the traffic jams? Um, 
you know, what, how could you problem solve to avoid being in traffic jams? Um, are you disorganized? Is that, is that why things happen? Were you disorganized at work? And so when the printer jammed, um, you know, it caused you to, to stress because you were not getting your work done. So it could be relationship issues, financial issues, getting in late notice before you come to work, a late notice in the mail, and of course that makes you not feel real good. So um, looking for those ways. Look for any predictable problem that you can solve. These are just examples, waiting in line at the bank, and you know the bank at lunch is always going to be busy, getting stuck in rush hour traffic. Is it in your control to stop unnecessary stressors? So this is where, after today, the 10 stressors that you wrote down, I want you to go back and try to problem solve. Is it in your control to try to change these and eliminate these? Remember the Groundhog Day movie? He kept going through the same thing until he finally figured out what he was doing wrong, and so he eliminated each problem each day until um, it was done. The next one, cognitive restructuring. We all have inner dialogue. Everything we do, we have inner dialogue. Sometimes self-imposed rules and judgments about our life. We think, why does this always happen to me? It's too difficult, I can't do this. What if I make a mistake? We label, we call ourselves names, and we all have to face that. And again, it comes back from that negative thinking pattern. So he talked about a way to change this. So he, he made out the A plus B equals C, A being the activating, activating event, the stressor, B is your belief about that event, your thoughts, and then C, how did you end up being the rest of the day? Did it make you sad or depressed? The kind of the consequence. So an example is you had a flat tire on the way to work and our automatic thought, this is the worst thing that could happen to me. I'm going to be late to work. Everybody's going to wonder why I'm all the time late. So, and then you get down and angry kind of the rest of the day. So he introduces the letter D. Okay, so he's saying dispute your overly negative thinking or thoughts. When you go out on being late or stop to think to yourself, is this really the worst thing that could happen to me today, that flat tire? Is it really the worst thing that could happen to you today? Does everyone really, really think you're late all the time? Dispute it. Argue with yourself. So here's another example about how to change your thinking. And this is from Dr. Amit Sood. Um, he lives way up north, and um, he had been snowing and really cold. And he, uh, somebody asked him how he felt that morning. And he paused, and he said, well, I heard myself say, less than perfect, but better than expected. And that's so true, isn't it, particularly in the way it looks outside today. And when he was walking onto his office, he said, less than perfect, but better than expected. How true is this? I could have veered off the road. My car's battery could have died. I could have slipped on the pavement. But none of that happened. I woke up this morning in a warm bed, and I had food to eat for breakfast. So again, every day, this is something that you may have to work on all the time. And that's okay to dispute it, because Dr. Amon says that when we have a negative thought, our brain emits a chemical that actually makes us feel bad, physically, everything. So all the more reason, practice thinking positively and try this disputing your thoughts and be aware of our thoughts, number one, first. So we'll go on to the next one, which is acceptance and mindfulness. Acceptance means that when we accept there are some stressors, and there really is, some stressors are totally out of our control, and we know that. So we accept that maybe it's a storm we have to pass through right now, and you need to learn how to escape it and turn it into something positive. Like I said, we're so distracted nowadays, we're so busy that we're forgetting to experience the present. 
Mindfulness is nothing more than active attention on the present. That means living in the moment and awakening your senses again to experience. So here's some examples. I read a story of a monk who was doing dishes. And how many times are we doing dishes and either watching the TV or doing something else and not paying attention? Well, he decided to pay attention. He felt the hot water. He felt the dishes. He heard sounds when you scrape the dishes. Uh, he smelled the dish soap. So he just paid attention to that experience. And I have walking my grand dog. I was able to keep my daughter's dog for a year when she went to New York to go to school for a year. And so I live out by Lake Hefner, and I live in a neighborhood that's got lots of trees. And so instead of going, okay, we need to go get this done, or you know, thinking how cold I was, I just started paying attention. And I listened to all the bird sounds like I did notice, I did notice this, that when the eastern sky very first begins to look light blue, that's when the birds actually sing. And there was a bird on the same house every day. It was a mockingbird. And so I decided to pay attention one time, and I heard about 13 or 14 different, different sounds from that one bird. I looked at the trees and how they changed over season. I heard wind chimes in the morning and the evening. At the lake, um, I would take her walking at the at Lake Hefner. I, one time we stopped and the breeze was going. One time I noticed on my face it felt warm, and the next time it felt cool. So just being in that moment, paying attention, letting our senses experience this again, because we are just going way too fast. We get into autopilot sometimes so much, like getting to our workplace and going, how did I get here? Um, anyway, repetitive things like ironing and things, we want to distract our mind instead of actually paying attention. And um, paying attention actually is a respite from worry and anger. So we're going to do a little experiment while you're sitting there. Uh, you don't have to close your eyes or anything. I just want you, if you're not stopped up, and if, if so, you can use your mouth. I just want you to take about five breaths through your nose. All right, now pay attention to the temperature of the breath. So you notice it's cool going in and it's warm going out. So that's what I'm saying, just paying attention to things like that. And like I said, when we're being mindful of what we're doing, even in our work, we actually, it's a respite from worry. So very important here, step five is resilience. And this is because of stressors that are out of our control, we're going to experience the stress response and we're going to have too much cortisol. So you have to do things that make your body resilient against the stress effects on our body. So exercise is the first thing. Exercise lengthens those telomeres. Remember those telomeres that shorten because of stress? It actually lengthens them back out. I read a study where a 24-year-old and a 55-year-old had the same, almost the same length of telomeres. And part of that is because the 55-year-old actually was an exerciser. Um, it elevates our mood states and it uses up the stored fats and sugars from the stress response. It also uses up the cortisol and then it builds up the brain-derived neurotropic factor. That is the support system of the brain. It supports neurogenesis and so very, very, very important. Whoops, went the wrong way. There we go. Eating well. It boosts, some foods boost serotonin. Again, the calming brain chemical makes us feel good. There are some foods that cut cortisol and adrenaline. Adrenaline is that first response whenever the, the stress response happens. Uh, it also, you know that foods with antioxidants shores up the immune system and it lowers blood pressure. So also in your packet, I do have a whole list of those foods and what they do. So again, we'll look at that here in just a few minutes. So the last one in uh, this is uh, sleep. As far as being resilient, you've got to get sleep. 
And I'm going to tell you, you really need to work at trying to get a minimum of seven hours. There's so much that happens when we are asleep. You see the lady cleaning out the brain? That's the glial cells that go in and clean out toxins and wastes out of our brain. And that happens when we're asleep. So also I told you that's when our short-term memory moves over into our long-term memory. Um, also, it boosts our, it sets our immune system, it builds up our immune system, it helps with metabolism. There's so many, many things that happen when we are asleep. So the last step is the social support. This will really help whenever we are stressed. Having somebody to talk to, be it a family member, friend, neighbor, community members, somebody to be there. Can you imagine going through a diagnosis of some illness by yourself and not having a support network? In your packet, I actually have an exercise for you to do to, to define who your support network is. So having that support network, major, major thing. So other techniques that help, these little things right here actually are like putting money in the bank. Even though you don't um, actually may be experiencing stress every day, when you practice these things every day, it's like putting money in the bank and it helps you be ready for it. So deep relaxation breathing, uh, most of the time we don't breathe below our chest. Uh, journaling uh, actually is a way of getting our thoughts, our feelings, emotions, writing them out actually has been proven to help. It's like regurgitating that negative feeling out. It helps us to get it out. And then meditation. I will talk about meditation. So diaphragmatic breathing, if you'll notice the one on the left, when you inhale, you push your lungs down and that pushes on your diaphragm and then that pushes your belly out. And so when you exhale, then it all goes back into shape. So I'm going to, um, and let me tell you, deep breathing like this actually signals the vagus nerve in the body to calm, for the body to calm down. And so let's practice it. We're going to practice it. I, you know, if you were sitting right here, I'd be doing the same thing, but I think you can follow me. So you need to sit up straight. So you got room there in your torso. And I want you to take a long, deep breath to my count. And at the same time, put your hand on your belly and see your belly go out. All right, so I want you to take a breath in. Two, three, four, pause, and out. Two, three, four, five. See how slow we did that? Most of the time, we only use about a quarter of the alveoli, the air sacs in our lungs. And so this makes us use them all up. And so many good things happen. Um, let's do it again. Take a breath in. Two, three, four. Pause. And out. Two, three, four, and five. So one more I'm going to show you is, is Dr. Krishna calls it power breathing, and it's actually pretty noisy. If you can remember what it takes to fog a mirror, you can't just breathe on it. You have to go like that and make a noise. So, And that's why it's forcing more use of the air in your lungs and stuff. So <clears throat> anyway, when you take a breath in, you actually almost like gas. So I'm going to do it once, and then I want you guys to practice it. So listen, and then so purse your lips like you're about to kiss somebody, and try it again. Take a breath in, and studies show that the longer you can exhale, um, the actually the calmer your body will get. So those are very easy exercises, just taking time to do that every day. Journal writing is thought, like I said, to help us get emotional catharsis. Um, when we have a lot of tension, sometimes we can be so upset that we can't even begin to think about uh, journaling. But in actuality, you can do it from a third-party perspective, as if you're writing, as if you're looking at somebody else. 
and you can write it out and it takes you out of the emotion and then you're able to uh, actually write down she is this, she's experiencing this, she was upset because of this and it actually helps you um, to journal and we've done that as kids, especially girls. We've had our little diaries and stuff so we've learned how to do this. And meditation is um, it's just an exercise. It's, it's nothing mystical. Um, there's many ways you can do it. It is, again, it's a mindfulness exercise, like focusing on our breathing. When you're counting and doing those things, you're not, it's giving you a rest, but again, from what's stressing you out. Um, and it helps you to, uh, we're going to have thoughts no matter what. I know some people try to say that you need to get all your thoughts out, but we're humans. We're going to have thoughts. And so that's why you just, if you have a thought when you're doing that, just let it go away and just go back and focus on what you're doing. Some people repeat a word or a phrase or even a scripture. Um, and the bottom line is that it creates a biological response of relaxation. And so um, it is very beneficial. And I did put in your packet a couple of ways to do a meditation. And so, like I said, Dr. Krishna says to practice this every day. It's like putting money in the bank. Um, that can help you zact the effect of stress pretty fast and help you get relaxed, help you ease anxiety and feel more in control. So here is my contact information. If you need to contact me, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer anybody. Um, and so please um, definitely contact us. Look for our website, Thrive. Uh, we're at thrive.ok.gov, and we've got a lot of uh, things there for you, too. Let me peek just real quick. Okay. I don't think we had any questions come in yet, but I didn't open up your chat box, so you wouldn't have seen them anyway. Oh. But no no okay. questions yet. That's perfect. Uh, I sent them a couple of notes to be sure and post them there if you, okay. they were going to be. So you're going to show them your... Oh, yes. I emailed your packet to the guests that are online. Thank you. So they have it too. Just hit escape over there. Well, I lied to you. Let's see if we can get There we go. Good. Perfect. This is what he emailed you. The first thing is that perceived stress scale that I told you about. Then here's your support system. And here's those foods I talked about. And then here is some ways to do deep breathing, adding some visualization to it. And then here's some meditations um, that Dr. Amon did. And then here's some resources. This is all the videos I normally would have shown you um, in class. And then here's Dr. Krishna, who's with Integris Hospital. And then here's some books where I get a lot of my information that I also recommend. So I think we're done. I appreciate your op the opportunity to talk to you. And I'll be back in a few weeks to talk about your brain health. Thank you, Susie.